Hi everybody, welcome to Insight. Today we're going to make a twist on an old favourite, an old fashioned, but a particularly summery one. So we're going to start with a shaker or a stirrer, which is full of ice. And we've got some Sazerac rye. Per drink, we're going to do two ounces of Sazerac rye. Next of all, some simple syrup. Per drink, a quarter of an ounce of simple syrup. And we've got two types of bitters. First of all, orange bitters. So a good, decent sized chunk of that per drink. And finally, some cherry bitters. That's enough. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay, so we're going to stir that for a good 30 seconds and then strain that into old fashioned glasses over ice and then finish with a slice of orange peel. Thanks, there we go. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. Mm, yeah, those bitters really make it nice and light. Mm -hmm. Very awesome. nice. Cheers. Courtney, it's a pretty deep program this week. We've had some that are considerably lighter than this, but um, it's there's a lot of uh, meaning and perfection profundity in this, and it's it's really wonderful. Pairing uh, two pieces written about 90 years apart from one another, Schumann's Second Symphony in Bartok's Music for Strings, Percussion, and Celesta. So, but the Schumann was really the, the anchor of this program. And uh, what, what, so what do you take from this symphony? Uh, you know, it's, he has four symphonies, and what, what about this one is distinct for you? Well, I think Schumann's Second Symphony is the greatest of his four. It's actually the third chronologically, mm, right. um, written in 1845. Schumann was a very troubled individual. Um, he was very romantic in the kind of stereotypical sense of the word. You know, he loved poetry as much as he loved music. He lived in extremes. He was probably bipolar, mm -hmm. but in today's terminology. Um, he would stay up all day, all night in a manic phase for three days and write a whole piece and then disappear right. for days. And his wife, Clara, the famous Schumann, uh, famous pianist, wouldn't know where he was. Yeah. Um, he loved intensely. He had a voracious sexual appetite. He had syphilis because of that. Mm -hmm. um, there was just, he felt everything very, very strongly. And the second symphony is in C major. Um, Schumann wrote to Mendelssohn whilst he was writing it, saying that he'd had trumpeting and drumming in his head for days. So everything is, is related to a fanfare that begins in the trumpet at the beginning of the piece. Now, usually we think of a fanfare, we think of something loud, um, but this is this kind of muted, almost religious fanfare. So immediately that sums up the ambiguity of this piece. A happy piece, a piece that begins and ends triumphantly, but that was written in the middle of a great deal of adversity. Mm -hmm. So, um, the first movement development, I think, contains a nervous breakdown. I think we actually watch Schumann lose it in the first movement and then kind of wrestle back self-control to a triumphant end. Mm -hmm. um, the second movement, a scherzo, um, famously difficult for the violins, often used in um, auditions, right. um, steps away from that a little bit. The third movement then is the romantic slow movement par excellence. Um, shifting, yearning, and so emotional that Schumann had another nervous breakdown after writing it and had to spend a couple of weeks getting himself together before he began the finale. Yeah. The finale then begins with almost banal sounding marches at the beginning, you know, as if here I am, I've got my stuff together again, yeah. I'm ready to go. Um, but about halfway through, a second theme emerges, which is incredibly beautiful and that kind of transports us away from the everyday into something very profound. And I think the whole piece is about his art, his Schumann, an artist, and his struggle for self-control and for understanding, despite this very difficult emotional background um, that he was fighting with. Right. So people often miss that kind of, um, psychological unrest in the symphony 
because so much of it is so happy mm -hmm. and in C major. So I wanted to pair it with a piece that would bring out the darkness mm -hmm. in the piece. And a great way to do that is to pair it with the Bartok Music for Strings Percussion into Lasto. This is a piece that Bartok wrote in 1936. So Bartok had already lived through the First World War. He'd already struggled with keeping his life going as an ethnomusicologist. Um, and then in 1936, the spectre of fascism was rising yet again mm -hmm. in Europe. And Bartok was still living in Budapest. Yeah. But he could see what was coming. He was preparing for his escape to New York, which would, yeah. which would happen a couple of years yeah. later. His music was already being marginalized around the continent. Um, it was. Like any modernist, as soon as a populist government like the Nazis comes into power, anything that's vaguely difficult is marginalized. Right. And that was already happening to his music. Yeah. So Bartok's music is based very much in the folk music of Hungary um, and Slovakia and right. the area that he grew up in. He spent enormous amounts of time in the fields, literally cataloging folk music, either by writing it down or by recording it on wax cylinders mm -hmm. with his um, compatriot Kodai. And Hungarian music has a couple of distinctive features. It's often in more unusual modes than, than say, English or American folk music. So whereas a lot of our folk music is in the, the mode that's on C or the mode that's on D, the Dorian, mm -hmm. a lot of Hungarian music is in the Lydian mode, which is the one that starts on F, if you play all the white notes on, in a scale with a B natural, which has a tritone yeah. in it. Yeah. So, um, that kind of darkness is built into Hungarian folk music. Mm -hmm. And then of course, the language of Hungarian has enormous emphasis on the first syllable of words. Yeah. So you often get da 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 So a lot of Bartok's rhythms sound like that. ba 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 So those two characteristics give Hungarian folk music a very special flavor that we hear in the Music for Strings Percussion and Tulasta. The first movement of the four is this really eerie sounding fugue, mm -hmm. um, very chromatic, very gray, very frightening, I mean, mm -hmm. kind of diabolical and haunting. Yep. Um, so that's the particular movement that I wanted to have in the context of the Schumann, because it mm -hmm. sounds like some kind of deep psychological blockage. It, honestly, yeah. it could easily be any uh, sort of mid-century or, or even a little bit earlier uh, uh, sort of in incidental music mm. for either a play or a film. That's right. Yeah. And of course, um, the second movement, which is much faster and much more dance-like, is used in being John Malkovich mm -hmm. for that exact purpose. Yep. The third movement, which is one of Bartok's night music movements, um, was used in The Shining in the, right. in the first one. Mm -hmm. um, Bartok was obsessed with music of the night, but not relaxing music of the night like Chopin or John Field, right. but the night as in a time of psychological unrest. Mm -hmm. And I once visited Bartok's house in Budapest and his study is still as it was when he was there. So mm -hmm. the piano is full of cigarette butts. Yeah. You just smoke and drop them in the piano. Yeah. And he was obsessed with collecting insects. So on the walls of the study were all these glass cases of centipedes and mm. beetles, wow. all with a needle right the way through the middle, uh -huh. holding it. And that kind of centipede creepy crawly sound is very much in the music of, of his night music style. And this third movement um, really epitomizes that. So it's, it's not wrong to think of it in a kind of slightly gothic horror way. Mm -hmm. um, he was trying to evoke darkness and psychological unrest yeah which was you know very becoming more popular amongst the modernists in the 20th century after freud mm -hmm. started exploring the the subconscious mm -hmm. and unlocking that field of, of psychology and um you, you got that a lot in um other uh in, in the the uh, second Viennese school like berg who really explored that deeper darker side of psychology mm -hmm. which I think is a, a really important note about how to listen to this piece because, you know, if, if you're somebody who primarily listens at home to the the 19th century and maybe a little bit of the late 18th century of that German tradition, 
uh, you know, Bartok's going to sound totally foreign to you, just, um, you know, like, like seeing um, Dali or, or Kandinsky for the first time when you're only used to Rembrandt yeah. and, and the, um, the Renaissance yes. greats. So it, I, I, I think it's important to just approach it completely differently, not just wide-eyed and blank slate, but just have a different um, uh, expectation of goals yeah. and flavor. I mean, also, um, this idiom is so familiar to us because it's used in films all the Absolutely. time. And I never quite get why people know this music so well from films and listen to it in a film with no problem and then as soon as it's put into a concert context, suddenly turn up the nose and find it difficult and modern. Mm -hmm. This is this is the music of the past century. It's almost 100 years old. But it's a style that we all know really we well, we do. even if we don't realize it. And it's not just, you know, contemporary movies. In fact, it was maybe even more prevalent in the the black and white films of Hollywood, where um, many of the film score composers were writing in a more modernist way than maybe what we hear in, in the last... 20 or 30 years. That's right. And then the finale of the Bartok, the last movement, um, a fast dance that sounds very much like folk music. Um, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, yeah. ba -dum, ba -dum, all the kind of rhythms that Bartok would have heard um, in the countryside, people singing. Um, so it's, it's one of his last pieces before he leaves Hungary and goes to America where he studied, where he taught at Columbia. Um, it's actually wonderful. You can, you can visit, um, in Colombia, in the Upper West Side, where Bartok lived, and there's also a place that he stayed for a while in Columbus Circle. There's a picture of him on one of the walls. He had an awful time. Um, he didn't have health insurance. Um, Columbia didn't give um, non-tenured faculty health insurance, and they still don't. Okay. And um, he was dying of leukemia. Was only able to get health care because Kusevitsky showed up, oh, yeah. the conductor of the Boston Symphony, with a check and said, "Write me a piece." And he wrote the concerto for orchestra which was his last great popular piece um, before he died. So he had a rough time and there's something about his tenacity, but also just his, his frailty and his illness that we can hear in the music all the time. And, you know, I find that very attractive in music because music is able to express many of our emotions. And we've all been through a year that had plenty of dark corners and I find that while I want to be in the presence of music that's optimistic and uplifting, I also want to be able to sit with those feelings of of grief and of yeah. confusion and of, of frustration that the last year has had. Be given permission to explore them. Exactly, and, and exactly. Feel them. Yeah. So um, this is a program that, that has enormous optimism through the Schumann, but that also has this darker undercurrent, which I think is important for us to feel and explore at the moment. Yeah. Well, I'm very much looking forward to it. It's it's a very powerful program. I've been listening uh, a lot in the last few days um, to both pieces, especially the bar talk, um, and I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to that the very cool. Um, uh, uh, what's the pitch percussion? Is it a? It's not. It's a marimba or xylophone. xylophone? Yeah, xylophone solo. Yeah, it's great. that's kind of allegedly a Fibonacci sequence. Yeah, reified right. into music. That's right. So the beginning of the third movement. Right. Yeah. Right. So. Anyway, very much looking forward to it. Thank you for programming something so interesting. And um, hoping to see you all Friday or Saturday night in Jacoby Hall, or we are live streaming it as usual on Friday evening, 7.30 on the Jacksonville Symphony YouTube channel. Great. So thank you. Cheers. Cheers, everyone.